Hi, I'm Mark Lawson, president of Morningstar Music Publishers, and we are here today with Stephen Hamilton to talk about more organ music. So Stephen, welcome. Hello, Mark. It's a lovely day here at St. James Lutheran Church in West St. Paul. I'm on a three manual instrument built by the Olson Lethart Organ Company. It's 30 ranks. And I think I, I chose this instrument particularly because I think it would be what many people would have in their churches. And when they hear me play, they, oh, I have those stops on my instrument and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's very important to have an instrument that's very user friendly. Well, I know that over the years, you have featured many of Charles Callahan's publications in your various workshops. Kind of what drew you to the music of Charles Callahan and why do you find it to be so useful? Well, as I start my church music repertoire classes with a statement, you know, Sundays come by with embarrassing regularity. You know, you're playing on Sunday and you've played a post and everybody comes up, oh, that was a wonderful post -nude. Gosh, wasn't that just terrific? And you're back in your mind, you say, thank you very much. But tomorrow I have to turn in all the music to the church office because they're going to print a bulletin for next Sunday. And this liturgical cycle just goes on and on and on. And while every church organist in America plays all the works of Bach, all great 18 crowd prayers, all of the organ book line, probably all the works of Cesar Franck, all the works of, of Messiaen and so forth for that particular Sunday, there has to be a moment in all that where you need to take a break and can say, gee, I'd really like to learn a pretty tune. And that phrase sounds kind of trite because you could say, well, Bach, all of his tunes are, are lovely and so forth. But I'm talking about something that is, that is a toe tapping tune, something that the congregation would recognize. And the thing I liked about Charles's music is that it is what I call accessible. You can look at it and think, oh, gee, I could start learning this on Monday and it would be ready for church on Sunday, where if I decide I'm going to learn the D major Bach Prairie and Fugue, you know, you would need six months to get that ready to play for church. And meanwhile, while you're learning your Bach D major Prairie and Fugue, Sundays keep going by and weddings keep going by and funeral liturgies keep going by and confirmations keep going by. So you have to have an enormous amount of repertoire to be really successful as a church organist. And this is where Charles's uh, talent comes in. He's written many compositions that I would think would be uh, tuneful and appropriate, technically challenging, but not overwhelming. So, uh, so, so it just makes logical sense to me that we include Charles's publications in our workshops because he has written music for everybody, our Jewish friends, our, our friends of color, uh, Presbyterians, Catholics, Lutherans, every denomination. And the things that he writes, you know, circumvents all those complications and says, oh, here's a volume for me. And, and I think that's really terrific. I'm not sure you could make that case for the works of Messiaen and Mendelssohn and Bach and so forth that this is you know, my Sunday kind of thing. And the other thing too I like about it is that sometimes if you like to have a thematic Sunday, for example, you have a Sunday in all music of Jean Alain or music of all Bach, music of all women composers. You know, we have three hymns in the Episcopal hymnal that are harmonized by women. So you can make a big case for women composers. And then you can make a big case for, if you're in a Catholic congregation, some Celtic music. And one of the pieces that's in this workshop today is one of Charles's pieces from his Celtic book, Be Thou My Vision. And that would speak to that particular congregation at that particular moment. And I think it's very, very important. We're never ever quite sure why anybody comes to church. You know, they come to church to see their friends, they come to hear the uh, scripture, they come to hear a good sermon, they come because the architecture of the church, and they come because the music's good. And yeah. all of this that we put together has to be very, very good. You know, I have to play as well as the minister preaches, the church has to be as clean as he preaches. You know, we're all in this together. And Charles's music fits into that because there's something in all of these volumes that speaks to you. Mm -hmm. And you and the congregation 
is extremely important. Yeah. Well, over the years, he's done so many different things. As you've mentioned, he's done original pieces, partitas. He did a, has a wonderful musical manual series, postlude books. Let's look at what you're going to play today. You mentioned the Celtic piece. Tell us a little more about that one. Well, there are two pieces that I'm going to play from there. There is the meditation that is really quite beautiful. And I think really quite expressive. It really pulls at your heartstrings. I could see the mother of the bride going down the aisle to this meditation, tuneful and very melodic. And then the last piece that I'm playing today is kind of a scherzo and makes use of the principal chorus on the great. And it's kind of jig-like. And you kind of get that feeling from the Celtic concept of, of, of a big jig that's a basic two. Dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, and so forth. And that's very important. The nice thing about this is that you could make a whole Sunday out of the suite and have a prelude and an offertory, a communion, and a postlude from this one collection. And that's mm -hmm. another reason that Charles' music is so versatile, because he does have these collections that are thematic that you could use as a whole Sunday's worth of music. All right. Well, let's listen to this. piece, I think, is uh, from the Westminster Abbey Partita. So tell us about this piece. Having played two concerts in Westminster Abbey, I sort of fell in love with a hymn to Westminster Abbey. The first piece is a very quiet, introspective prelude. Of course, it's in three. One, two, three, one. And you sort of have the pulse of the heart in the pedal. He has one, two, and you hear the pulse. And then this beautiful melody comes in. It's embellished in a, kind of a harp-like flourish and these beautiful tonalities. And then the hymn tune comes in. I have used this at the Church of the Holy Trinity sometimes as the entrance is when, it, when the coffin comes in the church, the fair linen is put on it as the coffin comes up the center aisle. And then we sang, stand and sing Westminster Abbey. And it's just a very quiet, elegant composition that really casts a uh, magical mood over the congregation. There's a trio and there's an invention. There is a pedal piece for pedals only. Uh, that's difficult. I'm not sure exactly when you might use it except there's a big post that, that would work. So we're not talking about just one piece out of this collection. You could use everything that's in. And of course you could build a whole Sunday again on uh, Westminster Abbey. And maybe when the uh, scriptures are appropriate and, and get in cahoots with your rector, and this is what I'm going to do. And you could bring this all together by singing the hymn, then having the music interspersed throughout the liturgy.
I think we're ready to hear the next piece, which I believe is from Melodic Suite. This just pulls at your heartstrings. A beautiful, beautiful melody in a slow three, four. I use several contrasting sounds when the melody comes back in from the contrapuntal interludes and so forth. And it's the kind of thing we can listen to and just kind of go, oh, isn't that lovely? I can see the mother of the bride coming down to this composition. I could see this being a, a communion piece uh, some Sunday. I could see this uh, at a confirmation and I could also see it maybe at a funeral. It's just a, a gorgeous, lovely, tuneful composition that makes use of the softer sounds of the instrument. I think we have one more piece that we're going to hear, and that is from uh, Charlie's newest collection called Be Glad and Rejoice. There's lots of uh, wonderful arrangements in, in this. And as I was going through the collection a couple of weeks ago, I found this one on Hanover, Oh, Worship the King. This particular instrument has a wonderful set of reeds on the swell, but it also has a big fanfare trumpet on the choir. And although you're not gonna hear it today, it has a drop dead trumpet on Shemad in the back of the church. So I thought, well, how wonderful to use something very grand that lets us explore all the tonal resources of this instrument. So this is a hymn tune arrangement on O Worship the King that's very stately and very grand. And again, I think you could probably excerpt it as an introduction and perhaps you could even use it as a uh, interlude. And if this is going to be the last hymn of the day, then you could certainly use this as a postlude, which is probably how it was intended. It was very festive and makes use of the big sounds of the instrument.
thank you very much, Stephen, for sharing these pieces with us. And uh, for those of you that are watching this, if you'd like to look at more of Charles Callahan's music, feel free to go to our website. And if you go to the uh, composer biographies, you'll find his biography and you can filter and look at all of the Charles Callahan collections. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you for all of the wonderful music that you bring to us. You're more than welcome. It's my pleasure to have this opportunity. <laughs>